This is Larry the Barberman and today I'm at the premiere show in Orlando, Florida. I've had the privilege of having Lynn and Rob from Scorum. They're going to give me a quick interview. This is a, carry, a continuation of my interview when I visited their shop in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, on my interview, Lynn was not there, so we're just going to bring Lynn into this interview very quickly, then we'll get on. So, Lynn, I know Rob Stark. Rob Stark was from a teenager. He was a punk. He basically had friends around. He was smoking weed. They picked up a record album that had a Mohican, and Rob said, my dad's got some clippers. I can do this haircut. And it kind of starts from there. What was your start? Wow. <laughs> you just sum summarized a story of 45 minutes into 15 seconds. I applaud you for that. <laughs> I'll be working on it, okay? <laughs> well, um, the way that I started is after high school, um, I was 15. Um, my brother was already doing hair. Uh, but after uh, high school, you have a long vacation. So I had to have some work. And that was in a hair salon. Washing hair and uh, um, like the, doing everything that an apprentice does. But also, I started learning how to cut hair in, this, in that vacation, and I was really good at it. Uh, so I didn't know what to do with my life, so that's why I got into barbering. Okay, so it's just like a kind of random, nothing better uh, to do. Well, I was, always, I was al always interested in it, but that was more because my big brother was a hairdresser, so I saw what he was doing, and I was really uh, was appealing to me what he was doing and with the end of course with the people and stuff like that so yeah okay so what i now need to know is how did the two of you get together <laughs> rob can answer this one okay well we're having what short answers right yeah. okay so i had this girl up north where i was living on a blue yeah. monday on a blue monday but uh, this girl i mean i was really in love with her and she moved to the south so I was, because she wanted, wanted to do some, uh, some school in the South for acting, and I was like, okay, I'll follow you, uh, and I'll just look for a job there. So one day, I walk into this shop down in the South of Holland, I'm from the North of Holland, and I walked in, and there is this guy standing on a little stool, putting little shampoo bottles on a shelf. Now this guy was thin as a nail. He had long hair till here in a braid, dyed black and he was about and he was pretty much the gayest gay guy i ever saw in my whole life and was like well i don't know if i want to work here but the thing was that was i was lame. totally <laughs> into the cult yeah he was he, so he, i love the hair of ian asbury and you have to have one time in your life if the, if you have the possibility long hair i loved it well it was super funny because and i gotta be honest we started talking and it was love at first sight, man. It's we were open for three months. That is the only thing. I was looking for a job. I didn't get the job, but I spent like... I, 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 the whole day? The whole, I, the whole day, I stayed there and we left so hard. But the shop they owned was part of a franchise. So they gave me the uh, number of the headquarters of the franchise. I called them uh, to see if they had a job in one of the other shops. So that's how I ended up with this franchise. And then... We had a hair show somewhere, and that's where I saw Lane again. And we we ripped the place apart. We got drunk. We made fun of the the, the hairdressers on stage. It was that, that was and well, we never kind of left each other. But also, what's really strange is um, that the way that he works and the way that I work is uh, so similar, and we didn't know that from each other. We never saw anybody cut hair the way that we cut hair. And he grew up here, and I grew up here. That, that but, and we were self-taught, so that was really so it was strange. meant to happen. No, that, would, that, that is actually, that is, that, is not, that is not even a detail. Because no, we, that's not we, a detail. We both work in a very strange way. We kind of turn the whole way of working with hair upside down, the technique. And I never saw, that's how I learned on the streets pretty much from trying, and I never saw anybody do it. And I walk into his shop, and he's doing it the same way. And I was like, where did you learn that? And I said, well, I taught myself. And I said, I cut like that. I taught myself. So 
you know, maybe that that's where the whole idea of Scornum was born. Yeah, now, could be. Now that we look back. Okay, so from my understanding, if I re re remember it correctly, the success of Scorum was born out of your irresponsibility in the respect that you bought a very expensive cabinet and then Scorum had to be built around the good quality of this cabinet and then when you took, kind of cleaned the windows if to say, as, as if to say we are open now, everyone started taking pictures and it started going viral. Would it be fair to say that that was how you think Scorum became successful as a barbershop? It is a very important part because where we went, well, I'm not going to say wrong, but we have always been very honest that Schorum, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's ours, but we stole every idea of Schorum from around the world. We did a lot of research. We love the American barbershop. We stole shitloads from them. We stole a lot from what was going on in Greece and Turkey. We looked at, you know, I mean, it's just like we, 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 we looked at history. We took a lot of things that we learned from barbershops around the world. We threw it in a pot. We stirred it around and Schorum came out. But the thing is, we, were, we, were, we really wanted to have an American barbershop in the beginning. That was the first idea. Uh, you know, jukebox, chrome, uh, rockabilly music, but then we found the cabinet. We spent half the whole budget, and Lane is like, "Was it we or you?" No, 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 we. This we, is what we. Right. No, no, no. Was... It was it was the father of my ex-wife. He had a friend, and he was a amateur um, antiques dealer, an, antique yeah. collector, and he found it. But Lane is very, and he was in the car going like, "Because my face, you know, if I'm happy." or my face speaks everything. And he was like, Rob, I have to bargain. And we walk in in this little uh, uh, a shithole of a town in Belgium. And this woman that's working there, she, we scared the shit out of her when we walked in. She was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be robbed. And we were like, oh yeah, we heard you got this barber uh, cabinet. And we walk around the corner and there is in mint condition, a cabinet that's been 120 20 years old. And my face just like, and the only thing I could say was like, I don't like it. And I just walked outside because he still had to bargain. And it his laugh, it, it, it connected here it was when he said that. My face said it all. The, wo the woman just saw this guy is going to spend all the money he got <laughs> just to get this thing. But then we were like, hey, we, we're not going to build an American barbershop. We're going to build a barbershop around our personalities and this, this 1920s, uh, 30s feeling, the art um, uh, a deco. That's what we wanted to do. So that was definitely a turning point in the whole plan to build the shop. Okay, and then the next thing I remember, more directed at Lynn this time, the other thing that gave you social, I don't know, gave you a social media bump, if you like, was the very candid wall chart that you made. You, by your own admission, these were not the best looking models. The photography wasn't the best. There was no retouching. You kept it raw and you kept it real. Just. Talk me through how this helped, again, to give you a score a bump worldwide. The posters, you mean? Yeah, the posters, yeah. Okay, well, I think that's, that's more a his story okay. than my story. <laughs> I have to be honest yeah. about that. Okay, cool. The posters are the next turning point on social media because what we found out is, you know, to have a successful barbershop, it's not just the haircuts, it's about understanding the psychology of a guy in general and we learned a lot about that and what we found out is that we were doing these kind of haircuts we're professionals you know you know when I'm talking about a pompadour you know what a pompadour is or a flat top or but we kind of forgot that the barbershop has always been for the average Joe and we totally forgot about the average Joe they were they didn't know where to go they were lost going to the salons and everything and then they had to take a magazine with male models that were absolutely perfect, you know, perfect bodies, perfect uh, with the jawlines uh, um, chiseled from a, a marble and everything. And then you have to take a magazine to this beautiful girl to say, hey, I want my hair like that. Th that's not what it was. And we were like, you know what? Let's make a poster, right? And we didn't look at the models, we look at the haircuts. So if somebody had a perfect flat top, but the model looked like shit, we didn't care. We were like, no, it's a perfect flat top. So the guys on the posters are the guys those are your friends. Those are the people you meet in bars. So you can literally go like, hey man, can I have that? And that was the best thing. And we didn't know shit about photography, um, uh, the, um, how to retouch. Photoshop. 
the Photoshop, so you actually see that a guy wore glasses in summer. There's still a white stripe, you know. I actually screwed up the fade on one of the, and, and but we made these posters just for in our shop. So when I screwed up the fade a little bit, but the hair on top is so cool. I literally say to Yella, the guy that took the photos, fuck it, we'll hang a little bit higher. Nobody will see, right? So we, we made like the most human poster uh, um, possible. No models, no, no but haircuts that people relate to. And they were like, oh, can I have that? Can I have that? And then Lane was smart enough to go like, maybe we can sell those. Maybe there's gonna be, and, and Yell and me literally were like, yeah, I don't think anybody's gonna. And then we literally sold thousands of them. And you know what the, why, what I think why, because if a barbershop has this on the wall, right? And it's normal haircuts, a client goes like, hey man, uh, I want that haircut. Can I have that haircut? And these barbers can actually just say, man, you can have that, but better, right? But that's the trick, you know, because the haircuts are far from perfect, the models are far from perfect. Real haircuts on real people. And that's when shit exploded on social media. Everybody was talking. They went viral. And then we did the DVD with, that, uh, with the haircuts. They went viral, and then shit really hit the fan. Okay, so it's kind of fair to say that your success is attributed to not contriving anything but keeping it real. You're irresponsible so you go and buy a cabinet at half the budget. You want to keep it real in the barbershop so you don't retouch it. Fuck it. I think, I think that the, the success is also that we, we just do everything that we think that we like. So if we have something in our head like we have to make a movie, we have to do that, we have to do this. We make that but there is not a purpose of making it. The making it is the purpose of the video. So if it doesn't matter if it goes viral, it doesn't matter if it, uh, if it gets enough likes or stuff like that. And if you think like that, it's, uh, then it's easier because you're just doing it for a laugh. Yeah. Okay, so we're in Florida now. Let's leave the Netherlands alone. We're from Florida Primaria. Uh, I saw you yesterday, i just been on Google and Googled the capacity of the auditorium that, where you've done a show yesterday and it was 2,643 of which you pretty much sold it out and you know you had the crowd on their thing. How overwhelming was that? Yeah, that is a really good feeling because I actually feel like a complete moron on stage. We, we never asked to be on a stage and when they asked us to do a hair show, we were like, we're never gonna do a hair show. We don't have flashing lights, we don't have dancing models. We got ugly models, you know, while there's a lot of companies that go to, you know, they got all the buff guys. And, 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 we just, and we just get guys from the streets. But, you know, I mean, it's hard. I, we do not want to blow smoke upon our own ass because Schoenem, for, for, I mean, we are far from the best barbers, you know. We know how to do a haircut and blah, blah, blah. But when you're on a stage and you get these energy from the people and you're super nervous, we're not afraid to screw up anymore, I think. So we just go on there, we hug each other, and we say, okay, let's have some fun. And we try to take the feeling from the barbershop to the stage. So we're not on stage going like, oh, you use one and then you go to half and then you go to zero and then you got it faded in. We just go like, ah, you do this and then you do a little bit of that and then this happens. And people just sit there like, Really? And we go, yeah, really, that's, that's what we do, right? I mean, some people try to make it into rocket science, but it's not. But the beauty is, even after doing haircuts for 28 years, I, now I finally start, start, feel like I'm starting to learn. You know, it's barbering, it's really not that hard to learn. It'll take a lifetime to master. And the energy, I would never go on stage without Lane though. You know, it's, it's a friendship thing. We have fun. The day where, and I think the people feel that, that we're actually on there going like, how did we end up here? You know, we just, we just own this little barber shop. So when the you idea of the show is that we have fun. So, because if you're going to think, oh, the, the audience has to have fun, then things go wrong. So usually it's like, if we have fun, the audience has fun. But if, it, if I'm going to say it bluntly, I don't give a shit if the audience has fun. But if I would give a shit, they wouldn't have fun. Yeah, no, no, that's that right. I mean, so your, your act to me is about self-deprecation, having a laugh, having fun, and showing them the end result. You know, you can come to our school where I get a little bit more serious and I can teach you exactly how I do it. Absolutely. That's it. We have been friends for so long, and we see, see how 
absurd it is that we end up on a stage because we are, actually are a little bit of screw ups. We love to drink, we love to party. A lot of people were like, oh my God, these guys are never. And now we're somewhere, I mean, we suck it in. We enjoy it, we love it, but we would have never expected it. So, and we realize that tomorrow it can be over. So live every show, do every show like it's the last one, you know, because, well, I, I, I think every guy has his best mate. Right? Well, I do this with my best friend, so we're just having fun. It's like going to uh, it's hard the to pub. Say. Yeah. The pub. Or being, no, actually, Almost. it's like being in the shop yeah. in the old days, the old school shop, which is now the academy. Yeah. So tell me something. When I came to your shop last February, did you ever envisage that you'd be doing not something of such a magnitude? I don't think that you can plan such a thing. Because if, 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 if you start out with a plan like that, it's going to fail. So I think that it just, it was an organic thing for us. It went gradually there and school that was uh, organic. Everything was organic. So, but a lot of people think that we don't have failures as well. But we try a hundred things and one thing succeeds. So the other 99, they don't succeed, they really fail, but people don't see that. But we need those 99 failures for that one thing that's going to succeed. Yeah, that's something that resonates with me when you know the story of Edison. Because the story of, well, one of, uh, kind of like an excerpt from Edison's story, a journalist went up to him and said, Mr. Edison, why do you persist in these experiments? You failed 999 times. And then Thomas Edison said, young man, you do not understand how the world works. He said that I have not failed 999 times. I have successfully identified 9,990, whatever the sum yeah. was, that doesn't work, which puts me 999 steps closer to one step that does work. Well, but and also <laughs> the, exactly that. The, that 99 failures were very much fun to do. So, yeah, it's, it's something like that. Plus, well, it, you know, it was, never the, it was never the plan. No, never. Still. You can't plan that. Right, but, and we get a lot of, uh, we hear a lot of young kids that are inspired by our shop, and, and that warms the heart. But the best thing that we ever heard was in uh, Canada, and this old guy comes up to us. Mm -hmm. Like, really, I mean, you know, like an older guy, and he goes like, boys, I have had a barbershop for 40 years, and the last... Um, 15 years have been so bad uh, that I was getting close to having to shut uh, bankruptcy. Like to, to bankruptcy, he said. And then you guys started your shop, and all of a sudden I got these kids coming in uh, into my barber shop asking for haircut. He says, and for the first time in 20 years, I took my family on a holiday, and he had tears in his eyes, yeah. and we were just like, because we didn't realize the impact that that little barbershop had but that's the best story I ever heard yeah. because then I realized that we actually you know influenced a life somewhere way on the other side of the world and that that was a thing of beauty you know because we just love that the whole barbershop is having such a revival all these companies all the small companies the guys that make beard oils in their uh, the garages and do all these super cool designs I love that shit so mm -hmm. that, that only that we have been such a little part of that, for me that's very, very rewarding. That, that's also one of the reasons why we are on stage, because we never wanted to be on stage. We actually had a lot of conversations about not doing shows, but because a lot of, so much people got inspired from us, and we're still having fun on stage, that's why we do it. Okay, so let's talk about tours, because when I came to the shop in February, you was kind of saying that there's deals going on with the tours. Tell me some of the places that you've been since last February. I know you've been like all over the shop, just for the purpose of the camera. Just tell me some of the places that you've been. Japan, Australia, Brazil, Chile, Canada, Chile, Mexico, America a lot of times, England, Germany, uh, Sweden, Denmark, uh, uh, and we're, and we're New Zealand. New Zealand. Wow. So, and I think that we're forgetting half Sa of it. Singapore. So. Okay, so name me two of your favorite places that you've been to and why. Dublin. 
Okay, Dublin. yeah, I yeah. saw you at Dublin. Yeah, well, what, one, one thing that's really weird, you, when you're in Europe, you do not have to travel very far to see beautiful things. I am a sucker for Ireland. I love, I, I love the people, I love the hospitality, I love the... Um, um, the beer? <laughs> yeah. I love Guinness. I, I mean, maybe, maybe Guinness is the main reason I want to have it. Ireland is for me, and, and for you, what is, what is it? I just went to Tuscany. And that was the most beautiful thing that I have ever seen in my life. And these are all, again, sharing your story with people and sharing uh, the Rusal brand. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you've seen one show, you've seen them all. I got to be honest with you. I mean, we, we would never be able to do another show. We just, we, we don't even know what's going to happen. I mean, the story is pretty much the same all the time. But we could not change it into uh, a dancing elephant or whatever, no. you know. So if you've seen it once, that's an advice to everybody. If you ever we seen only show have watch. one dancing elephant. So, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a dancing elephant on meth. But um, no, if you've seen it once, you don't have to go again. Okay, so let's talk about your product line, Rusal. Uh, I think when I came to see you in February, you had two different pomades, two different colors. There's some new additions to the range. Tell me a little bit about the original product and what additions you have now. Lane can do that one. Well, we started out with, uh, uh, with the two products. That's, that's going to be the red water-based uh, product and uh, the green oil-based. That are the original ones that we started out with. But we needed a little bit more because um, it, wasn't, it wasn't heavy enough, uh, it wasn't shiny enough, it was blah, 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 blah. You always need something. So after that, we made uh, the red water-soluble on steroids. That's the blue one. Um, and we made the green on steroids. That would be the pink one. So that's oil-based and water-based. Water-based means you can put it in as a gel. It looks like a, a, a wax, but you can, you can rinse it out as a gel. And the oil-based products, you need, it needs build-up. So the more that's in your hair, the better that it looks. So Old school, new school. Old school, new school. After that, we uh, uh, got into... What do we have after that? <laughs> we started with the shampoo after that. We, we, we got uh, beer products. Yeah, but I, I, I'm just the thinking... The, I just think, yeah, after that we got uh, the tonics, and that's also uh, old school and new school. Old school and new school. The grooming tonic is a very new school product that you can use... Well, you can pretty much use for everything. That's like pre-blow dry. You can use it over the water solubles. You can use it over the oil base. It's going to give an extra layer. A little bit shine. That, that is pretty much... I think that is the best product we ever made. Yeah. yeah. I, it's so versatile, and we sell a lot of that one. And I, to be honest, I could not do a haircut without that product anymore. Anymore, it, no. It's the best. But the, we really want to have a blue tonic because that's like your old school barbershop product. A true hair tonic, that's what barbers used to use because they were not able to wash the hair because of all the grease. And this was in the time there were no other products in Greece. So the barber would use uh, a tonic to give a friction. That's, that's, that's where the barber made his money. And the cool thing is all the tonics were usually made by the barber himself. There were all these little secret formulas love that shit so we were like you know we always want to be in balance if we do a new school product there's got to be an old school product with it now we came out with two um well there are a little bit of the geek guys in uh, the pomade class you know uh, a fiber and a matte product a matte clay matte clay because we kind of we kind of needed them for a looser uh, look because all our haircuts are still based on the classics but you know, we want every haircut to be able to be combed into a classic, but if you want to wear it a little bit more loosely, so we came out with a fiber and a clay. We got our shaving cream that really smells like grandpa. We are really happy it's with really rich formula as really, well. Yeah, grandpa, you mean like a old spice kind of smell? Like really so. <laughs> yeah, like not really your dad, grandpa. <laughs> that's, living, that's, living, that's lying there for three weeks. You know, yeah, <laughs> that grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, really rich. It's, it's really um, a soapy uh, fragrance. You know, when, well, okay, it sounds a bit weird, but when you're, I mean, you, you, you always remember, fragrances are very important to make a connection in your head because they stay forever. And when you kiss grandpa, you know, there was always exactly Old Spice, uh, the tobacco or whatever. It, it's one of those smells, you know? It's, it's it, it, yeah, it's like really, it stays in your mind. So we're really happy with that product. We got 
Uh, we beard, got also uh, beard foam, beard foam, beard foam, and we have a degreasing formula because uh, there was a lot of asking of our oil-based products. People aren't used to using that anymore, so we got a lot of emails like, "How do I get it out of my hair?" So we started with a degreasing formula that contains a conditioner that you can use as a conditioner as well, um, a scrub shampoo and a daily shampoo. And if you combine them, you start with the conditioner, go through it for a couple of minutes, then you do the, 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 scrub. the scrub. And daily. Then daily, and it will be out of your hair for 99%. It doesn't need it, but that's why we formulated it. And then we have a, f uh, a beard foam and a beard uh, balm. And the beard foam, that's more like a leave-in conditioner. So it, 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 it also has the... Uh, um, how do you call it? Deodorizer. De deodorizer in it, so it uh, takes uh, takes out smells and stuff like that. And then the the balm, just go over it, and it's it's happy. It's wow. Done. It's good. Okay. And just a quick question: Which one of these products are proving particularly popular uh, seller? Let's say if a barber shop anywhere in the world wanted to stock these, and they kind of just wanted to hit the ground running with it. It is really weird because I would say the pink, because that's my favorite product, yeah. together with the grooming tonic. Uh, we know our best seller is the blue. Blue and fiber. But the fiber and the clay are, are breathing down blue's neck because they're doing really, really good. I'm, but that's the weird thing. Everybody has their favorite product, you know? It's so hard to and say. And you can mix everything together. That's, that's unique for a brand, I think. Yeah, that you normally can you cannot mix an oil-based pomade with a water-soluble pomade, but you can actually mix the red and the green, or the, um, the pink and the, and the blue, you know? Everything is, you, you can mix them. You, you can try everything. And yes. The beauty, and the beauty is, guys buy a lot of products. Yeah, I mean, once they got one, they want the collection. Trust me on that one. Okay, so two more questions, because you've got to go and prep for your model. They're expecting you on stage at four o'clock. What is the next big thing for Scorum outside of world travel and outside of products? We are working on a project that I think has never been done before. I can't tell you too much, but you do remember the DVD that we made with the 10 haircuts? Well, we're going to do another DVD, but it's not going to be us. But partially. It's gonna, but it's going to be... It's, it's going to be, be cool. partially us. It's going to be cool as shit. And we're going to do that this month. Uh, we're going to try to raise money uh, with it to make sure that uh, kids that are born or are in prison or are born in... Uh, poverty. Uh, uh, poverty get the chance to get uh, education. A barber education or whatever that's our new that that is the biggest project we've ever done and you'll be hearing from well you know we can give you a prim, uh, primer later maybe but um it's still a little bit of a secret but it's going to be it's going to be really cool okay so just give me a shout when you when it when it comes and last question because every single well not every single i would imagine a vast majority of hairstylists and barber would just like to know what two things they can do to get maximum impact from their social media? What, what actions could they take? Ooh, that is a hard one because social Babies media... Babies and animals always no, work. It's really, yeah. <laughs> dogs, cats, and kittens. Uh, no, kids, cats, dogs. That's it. You know, they always work. No, social media is getting harder. Stay, stay honest with your haircuts because what we see a lot now is photoshopping and um, all... Um, the filters and everything, just, just, you know, make sure you got beautiful photos, yeah? If you want to take photos of your haircuts, do it at one point in the shop. Make sure they're recognizable. That is, that is the stronger thing, that when you swipe through your feet, that you see this one way of lighting or whatever, that you go like, oh, those guys posted, yeah? So you swipe back, that is really important. But it's gotten harder because it's gotten so big. But make sure you got personality in everything you post. Make sure that the people like what you're doing. Do not push it up, push it upon them. That's what you got to be careful with. And yourself, Lee? I'm not a social media guy at all. I don't even have a page, so... He doesn't have Instagram, Facebook, nothing. I don't like social media. I'm the social media guy. All right, okay, okay. Yeah, because that was going to be one of my questions. Why are you not? Because yesterday I saw your post that you did after you came off of the stage. 
the stage and he called it you the what is it bearded bastard yeah and I but he had no you had nope. no hashtag I just gave him that name but no he has no he has nothing no nope. which is kind of cool because it gives him so much more time I'm on my phone forever you know promoting the business promoting myself I mean you got to be careful because social media social media is a monster you know you buy it and it's a cute little monster but then you start feeding it and it gets bigger and it just gets hungrier and hungrier and hungrier and all of a sudden it's kind of pushing upon you like oh i haven't posed for it you got to be careful with that as well you got to keep enjoying it otherwise social media turns into anti-social media i actually saw our instagram page maybe twice <laughs> wow that's how disengaged you are but one thing i must confess when i email you guys Lane is always straight back on it. I'm so, always, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's good. That's a, a nice kind of balance. Don't email him because he will not reply <laughs> in, in, in a year. <laughs> Ever. Okay, okay. <laughs> right, guys, I better let you get back to your preparation. Thank you for taking the time out. Continue doing what you're doing. As you've said it for yourself, you're inspiring people all around the world. So you're obviously doing something right. Guys, Rob has given you the simple solution how to uh, expand your social media. It's all about doing, you know, reading and reading, listen to Rob talking, it can help. You have to take action. So guys, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Larry. You're very welcome. See you real soon.